Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to today's Sunday at the Met presentation. I'm Catherine Rarig, one of the curators in the Department of Egyptian Art, and today is my great pleasure to introduce to you a friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Nicholas Reeves. I've known Nick Reeves for many years because of our mutual uh, interest in the Valley of the Kings, the great cemetery of the royal kings of the 18th, the 19th, and 20th dynasties of the New Kingdom of Egypt. And this year, Dr. Reeves has a Sylvan C. Coleman and Pamela Coleman Memorial Fellowship to work in the department, and the two of us are working on various things to do with the Valley of the Kings. Dr. Reeves got his bachelor's degree at University College London, and then he went to the University of Durham in Northern England for his PhD. Since then, among other things, he has worked as a keeper or curator at the, uh, in the Department of Egyptian Antiquities at the British Museum, and he has also been the director of an expedition, the Amarna Royal Tombs Project, which has conducted a couple of seasons in the Valley of the Kings, because he believes there is a third Amarna royal tomb somewhere in the area where, in that central part of the Valley of the Kings, that is a complement to Tutankhamun's tomb and tomb 55. He has also worked as a curator of the Myers Museum of Egyptian and Classical Art at Eton College, and during his tenure there, he uh, organized a beautiful exhibition called Egyptian Art at Eton College, which some of you may remember was here at the Metropolitan Museum in 1999. He, of course, has written many things on the Valley of the Kings, but he has also become a great expert in the objects in the Tomb of Tutankhamun. And today he is going to share with us his thoughts on what is probably the most famous work of art from ancient Egypt, and certainly one of the most spectacular works of art in the Egyptian Museum, Cairo, the beautiful golden mask of Tutankhamun. So please won't you welcome Dr. Nicholas Reeves. Catherine, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to speak to you today. Now, The day was a Sunday, like this one, and the time not so very different, four o'clock in the afternoon, November the 26th, 1922, 91 years ago. The place, the entrance corridor of a newly uncovered tomb deep within Egypt's Valley of the Kings, the excavators, Howard Carter and the fifth Earl of Carnarvon. Before the two Englishmen lay a walled up doorway, its plastered surface stamped with large impressions of the oval necropolis seal, making a small hole, sorry, making a small hole, Howard Carter inserted a candle to peer inside. At first I could see nothing, Carter later wrote, the hot air escaping from the chamber causing the candle flame to flicker. But presently, as my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues, and gold everywhere the glint of gold. What the diggers had found proved to be the antechamber of a tomb for which Carter and Carnarvon had been searching for years, Tutankhamun. The room was the first of four, each richer than the last, all shimmering with precious metal and some of the most sublime works of art to have survived from the ancient world. The find was stupendous, and all the more extraordinary because Tutankhamun had been a relatively minor player on history's stage. He had ascended the throne as a child, and he had died, still young, around 1323 BC, after a rule of little more than 10 years. It was a decade overshadowed by an extraordinarily turbulent past, for Tutankhamun was son of the revolutionary pharaoh Akhenaten, who had chosen to abandon Egypt's traditional gods in favor of a single divine essence, the Aten, or solar disk. His had been a classic struggle for power, state versus church, a declining kingship ruthlessly attempting to stifle an increasingly ambitious priesthood. The temples of the old religion had been closed down, 
their wealth taken. Shaking off all vestiges of control, Akhenaten had established a new capital elsewhere, in remote Middle Egypt, at a site now known as El Amarna. The result was disaster. The economy faltered, the empire crumbled, and the repressed populace fell increasingly prey to fear and suspicion, with stick-wielding bully boys everywhere in the tomb scenes, ready and eager, it seemed, to enforce Pharaoh's will. Before long, Egypt was in meltdown. The principal achievement of Tutankhamun, or of those who were pulling the boy, string, uh, the boy king's strings, would be to wrench the country back from the brink. Because of the upset he caused, Akhenaten's memory would be reviled for generations. He was the criminal of Akhenaten, responsible for the time of the rebellion. Pharaoh's exquisitely decorated temples were reduced to rubble. His names and images were destroyed wherever they were found. The period, an aberration, simply ceased to exist. All memory of the heretic and his hated family was struck from the records. The consequences of this systematic persecution of Akhenaten's memory were as unseen as they were unintended. For when the Valley of the Kings came to be officially stripped of its treasures and closed down in around 1000 BC, the burials of the Amarna pharaohs were missed. Since their names had been struck from the records with such total efficiency, their tombs could no longer be located. The ultimate irony is that the burials of this hated period are among the very few in the valley to have escaped relatively intact down to modern times. The first to be found would be that of Akhenaten himself in 1907 within tomb KV 55, followed some 15 years later, of course, by that of the king's son Tutankhamun, discovered by Carter and Carnarvon within the tomb now numbered KV 62. And very probably there are more finds of the period still to come. Here we see the valley's most recent discovery, KV 63, opened in 2006. Again undisturbed, it contained a large cache of surplus coffins and refuse embalming materials. The debris, it seems, from other Amarna tombs yet to be revealed. But what of Tutankhamun's burial? At the time of his death, the king was still a young man who seems to have given little thought to preparations for the afterlife. Indeed, the fact that he was buried in an adapted private tomb seems to confirm that death had come unexpectedly, before there had been time to quarry anything more substantial. And this raises an intriguing question. For the time available for quarrying chambers, um, for if the time available for quarrying chambers had been so limited, how was it possible to prepare at equally short notice such a wealth of spectacular burial furniture. This, as we shall see, represents the key conundrum of Tutankhamun's tomb. As finally excavated, Tutankhamun's burial produced considerably more than 2,000 individual treasures, of which a single piece stands beyond comparison by its sheer beauty and physical presence as the undisputed centerpiece of the collection. That object is, of course, the gold mask, first revealed in 1925, still in position on the head of the king's mummified body. Not surprisingly, Tutankhamun's gold mask has been on pretty much constant public display ever since, both at the Cairo Museum and in a range of international traveling exhibitions. While images of it have naturally featured in books, magazines, and telephone, uh, television documentaries beyond number, Today, Tutankhamun's mask is not only the most famous object from Tutankhamun's tomb, it represents one of the most enduring uh, images of Egyptian civilization as a whole. But what beyond its shiny form do we, do we really know about the piece? That's the question I'd like us to address today, dispassionately and with the critical eyes of the forensic archeologist examining the piece in the greatest possible detail, inside and out, and questioning each and every aspect and feature of it. The exercise will, I hope, prove an interesting and enlightening one. 
For while countless millions may have looked, it turns out that the world in its entirety has completely failed to see that Tutankhamun's mask had never been intended for Tutankhamun at all. In this lecture, we'll follow the clues which lead to this conclusion. We'll examine who the mask actually had been made for. And finally, we'll consider the extraordinary ramifications of um, this new attribution. What can it tell us about discoveries which may still be to come? Let us begin, though, at the beginning and with a few basic facts. The mask carries the Carter Excavation number 256A. Its Cairo Museum Journal d'Entrée number is 60672 and its Cairo exhibition number is 220. Physically, the piece stands um, some 54 centimeters high and measures 39.3 centimeters wide and 49 centimeters deep. The thickness of the sheet metal from which it was produced is around 0.15 centimeters, expanding at the edges to some 0.3 centimeters. This metal is, of course, solid gold and of the highest purity. As a piece, it tips the scales at around 10.23 kilograms, which in today's market translates to uh, a metal value alone of more than $400,000. The first surprise is that the composition of this gold is not the same in every part of the mask. In fact, two basic colors of metal may readily be distinguished, a bluish silvery gold for the face and neck and a more yellowy gold for the surrounding headdress. An initial investigation of this color contrast was undertaken not long ago by a Japanese team led by professors Uda and Yoshimura of Waseda University in Tokyo. X-ray diffraction and X-ray fluorescence technology showed clearly that these apparent variations in color are indeed meaningful. The two surfaces are coated with differing alloys of 18.4 karat gold on the face and 22.5 karat over the main headpiece. But more than this, a similar contrast between the face and headdress may be detected in the composition of the core metal underlying these distinct surface finishes. Here again, the purity of the face substrate is slightly lower at 23.2 carats, compared with the purity of the gold employed for the main part of the headpiece, which stands at 23.5 carats. Clearly then, two separate batches of gold were drawn upon for the manufacture of these two distinct elements, a feature whose possible significance we'll return to a little later in this talk. The mask's face is very obviously a version of Tutankhamun's official image, as it had been established by the central government at the very start of the reign. As the king's official image, the same distinctive traits are encountered everywhere and in a range of materials both within and beyond the tomb. For the ancient Egyptians, this was how they were told and clearly believed their king actually looked. But can this official image be considered in any sense a true likeness? Is the mask, as Howard Carter proposed, a perfect portrait of the young king at the age of his death? In an attempt to answer this question, three separate and independent groups of scientists recently attempted a facial reconstruction based on CT scans of Tutankhamun's skull. As you will see, the results in each case are very different, not only from the king's ancient representations, but from each other. Can any of these be considered a more accurate portrayal? Crucial, I think, in assessing this are the twin guardian statues of Tutankhamun from his tomb. Physically, the size and relative proportions of these virtually replicate the size and proportions of the king in life, so far as this can be established from the measurements of the royal mummy. If the statue's bodies were indeed produced with such extraordinary attention to, phys attention to physical detail, then it's more than probable that the modeling of these statues' faces similarly followed closely the king's actual features. The most accurate impression of how Tutankhamun looked in life, then, I believe is most likely to be conveyed 
by the consistent developing series of images produced by the ancient Egyptians themselves, of which the gold mask is perhaps the finest, most subtly modeled of those portraits now extant. Here we see the back of the mask, inscribed with 10 vertical and two horizontal lines of hieroglyphic text. The inscriptions contain protective spells taken from chapter 151 of the Book of the Dead. The hieroglyphs are inscribed directly into the metal by the technique known as chasing and include Tutankhamun's prenomen, Neb Kepru Re. If we look more closely at this back view, we notice a surprising feature of the piece. It's badly damaged, with much loss of blue glass inlay. Curiously, no one seems to have asked why an object which had lain undisturbed for three and a half thousand years should be in less than perfect condition. Part of the answer in this case, it seems, um, is professional delicacy. Much of the damage we see today was evidently caused by Howard Carter himself. Not intentionally, of course, but inadvertently and perhaps inevitably in extracting the mask from the innermost gold coffin. In his notes, Carter records how quantities of liquid resin had been poured in antiquity over the, over the mummy. This resin had set solid and effectively glued both the mask and the mummy to the interior of the gold coffin. Only with the greatest difficulty was Carter able to separate the mask from this solidified mass, uh, mass and in the process, much of the blue glass inlay clearly fell out. Equally apparent, however, is that Carter was not responsible for all of the damage the mask now displays. Here is Harry Burton's famous photograph of the mask in place in the king's coffin, alongside a more recent detail shot. The arrows point to two specific areas of inlay, which, as Burton's photograph demonstrates, were already missing before Carter even touched the mummy. How is this second category of loss um, to be explained? Since they are surely part of the answer, let's look more closely at the two curious holes punched into the right lappet and indicated here by white arrows. As Burton's early photographs again show, these holes were already in existence when the mask was first uncovered. The piercings must, therefore, have been made in antiquity, in which case it is more than likely that the adjacent glass inlays were loosened and lost during the hammering required to produce them. But what are these punched holes? Again, it's a question no one seems to have asked. In fact, when first encountered by Carter, these holes held a wire, and that wire had served a particular function, to hold firmly in place one of the royal insignia, the flail. This is again an answer which prompts further questions. Why had such a fixing been necessary, and why on earth had it been accomplished in such a rough and ready manner. To understand, we need to consider the practicalities of the funeral, in particular the opening of the mouth ceremony intended to enable the dead person to speak and partake of food and drink in the next world. Here at top right, we see a well-known scene of this ritual from the papyrus of Hunefa in the British Museum. As this and other representations show, for it to be enacted, the mummy needed to be raised from the horizontal to a vertical, more natural position. While for a private individual, the mummy will simply have been manhandled into position, for somewhat heavier, more richly bedecked royal mummies, it seems that a wooden framework was employed. Such a framework is seen here on the left, resting on its three original trestles. This rare object, identified here for the first time, I think, comes from the newly discovered KV-63 store chamber. Recognizing the requirements of this ceremony, we can begin, I think, to visualize the problems which arose. During a practice raising of Tutankhamun's mummy, it appears the undertakers discovered that the king's flail fell persistently forwards and or sideways from its intended position. This obviously need, needed to be resolved, and with time now short, it needed to be resolved quickly which evidently it was, by banging two crude holes at an appropriate position in the lappet of the gold mask, dislodging in the process the two now missing glass inlays, and by wiring the wobbly flail firmly in place.
A third distinct area of damage is visible behind and on the protruding right-hand corner of the nemes headdress. This may also be connected with the opening of the mouth proceedings, as we shall consider. Notice how the metal is bent and distorted, distorted at the points indicated by the arrows. Why? Now, this crushing is the typical consequence of a violent concussion, and from its position, it suggests the unthinkable, that at some stage in antiquity, the masked mummy was actually dropped. It's difficult to imagine that a disaster of this magnitude could ever have occurred, but supporting evidence may, in fact, be detected in Carter's notes. Among the many small bits and pieces the excavator found scattered over the floor of the entrance passageway and antechamber were several loose elements of jewelry. These would later be recognized as sections which must at some stage have pulled loose from the beaded strapping decorating the king's bandaged mummy. A selection of those straps is shown here. The particular sections of these trappings the stray pieces form part of had been sewn to either side of the torso and legs where, because of their exposed positions, they had obviously been vulnerable to damage and loss. But when might that damage and loss have occurred? Since the mummy itself had been safely enclosed within its coffins, sarcophagus, and shrines at the time the tomb was entered by robbers in antiquity, the blame cannot on this occasion be laid on their, at their door. In fact, the only time these elements of jewelry could have been detached is before or during the king's funeral, but under what circumstances? As I have already intimated, an obvious opportunity for a fall will have been the opening of the mouth ceremony when the king's mummy was elevated by means of its wooden framework to a vertical position. Top-heavy as the mass body must have been, I wonder whether during that raising the balance was unexpectedly lost and the mummy simply tumbled forwards. Perhaps as someone reached out to steady the royal flail which chose to drop out of position at the same precise moment. Was it, I wonder, a fall of this sort which crushed the corner of the gold mask snagged and broke a section of the mummy's decorative strappings and sent scattering all di in all directions elements from this strapping, not all of which could be retrieved until 3,500 years later when uh, Howard Carter came along. It is, I think, a distinct possibility. Turning now to the mask's physical construction, Close examination from both inside and out reveals the headpiece to be a far more complex creation than is usually recognized. In fact, it's composed of at least eight separate components. Front and back panels, the uraeus and vulture, the face, two ears, the beard, and a collar panel. Each element had been either hammered to shape from sheet metal or else separately cast and jointed, soldered, riveted, or simply pressure fitted into place. When fully assembled, the mask's metal surfaces had then been smoothed, inlaid, chased, surface treated and provided with the finishing burnish which, externally at least, conceals so convincingly today most details of the construction process. This unexpected complexity of construction reflects the analogous complexity Egyptologists are now beginning to discern within Tutankhamun's burial as a whole. You'll recall the conundrum I posed at the start of this lecture. If there had been no time to provide Tutankhamun with a full-sized tomb, how had the time been found to, pre to prepare so much funerary equipment to fill it? The fact is, there was virtually no time to make anything. Indeed, as we shall see, it's becoming increasingly obvious that what Tutankhamun was buried with had nothing to do with him at all it had been appropriated from at least two of his predecessors. Let's take a closer look at one of these construction features, the separately fashioned face. This photograph of the mask's interior and the adjacent x-ray show clearly the lines of solder and of rivets which hold this face in position within the headpiece proper. This was, perhaps, the usual method of constructing such, such masks. As we see here, closely similar faces, though with integral ears, 
was subsequently being produced for the elite burials at Tanis during the 21st and 22nd dynasties. But Tutankhamun's mass displays other unsettling peculiarities also. First, in its blue inlays. While on the enclosing headdress, these inlays are consistently of glass, on the face proper, the inlays are all cut from stone, lapis lazuli. They may match in general color, but the material is dramatically different, and the combination of the two materials in a single object is unusual. Secondly, the gold of the face. This is not only a separately fashioned insert, but an insert, as we've seen, prepared from a batch of gold completely different in composition from that of the surrounding headpiece. The question is whether these anomalies are mere quirks of the manufacturing process, or whether, taken as a whole, they hint at something more, i.e. whether they are to be regarded as indications of alteration and adaptation. In other words, do these features indicate that Tutankhamun's mask had been taken over from a previous owner by the simple ruse of cutting out that owner's identifying face and inserting a new portrait? On this evidence alone, the odds are no more than 50-50. Maybe, maybe not. One further indicator, however, which we will now consider, shortens these odds considerably. Here we see again the photograph by Harry Burton of the mask as it was first encountered in place on the head of the royal mummy. Look closely to where the arrows are pointing. Two small discs may be seen lying on the surface of the wig lappets adjacent to each ear. What are these? Carter's notes explain. They're gold foil coverings, which have been applied in antiquity to conceal large piercings in the lobes of the mask's ears. What had been the point of this camouflage? Had the undertakers wished to hide completely the fact that the king's lobes were perforated? I think not. Why? Because the last photograph at bottom right shows these foils to be dished in form. This dished shape indicates precisely what the undertakers had been seeking to achieve, to hide the lobe's actual holes and reinstate the subtle depressions normally employed in three dimensions to indicate the presence of pierced ears. These detail shots of other sculptures from the same general period illustrate what I mean. In each of the pieces shown, the piercing of the ear is consistently acknowledged, not by an actual hole, but by a discrete circular depression or dimple. Interestingly, Carter notes that Tutankhamun's innermost gold coffin, seen here, had in antiquity been treated in the same way as the mask. Holes which had previously been drilled through each ear had subsequently been covered with dished patches of gold foil. The sole difference between the mask and the coffin, in this regard at least, is that the coffin's foil inserts still remain securely in place. Obviously, then, by the presence and subsequent concealment of their drilled earlobes, the gold mask and the gold coffin are intimately associated. Whatever conclusions we draw concerning either, it seems, is very likely to apply to both. Looking into the matter more closely, it transpires that fully drilled earlobes are, in fact, exceptionally rare in Egyptian sculptural representation. Indeed, it's possible to cite only one other large-scale image, again from Tutankhamun's tomb, a gessoed wood representation of the child king's head rising from a lotus. It's this piece, I suggest, which explains the full piercings in the ears of the gold mask and gold coffin. Here, the, pierc the piercings actually functioned. That is to say, holes had been made in each lobe, not to reflect the fact that the king in life had pierced ears, they have been drilled through for a purely practical reason, to accept separately modeled ear ornaments, as confirmed by the broken post of one of these earrings still in place in this wooden sculpture's left lobe. From this occurrence, we may, I think, draw a key conclusion, that if an image has drilled earlobes contrary to representational custom, then those drilled holes are there for a purpose. 
In other words, the original intention must have been for the ears of both Tutankhamun's mask and his innermost coffin, like the ears of the wooden lotus head, to carry ear ornaments. Just as apparent from the subsequent plugging of these holes is that by the time these pieces came to be employed for the king's burial, this plan to fit earrings had been abandoned. So far, so good. But what complicates this explanation is that depictions of kings actually wearing earrings are almost non-existent. Apart from the Tutankhamun lotus head described above, an extensive search within the literature produces no more than two instances. The first is shown on the left, a limestone relief fragment of Amenhotep I from the Theban temple many set, in which the king is shown wearing a large hoop earring. The second is that in the center, a limestone relief of Ramesses II in the Louvre, in which Pharaoh wears a similar large hoop earring elaborated with pendant drops, a type familiar from examples found in Tutankhamun's tomb, shown here on the right. Why so few instances? Self-evidently in the case of, Tutankhamun, of the Tutankhamun lotus head, and from the presence of a side lock in the two sided reliefs, all three of these representations depict Pharaoh as a child. These images, I would suggest, are the exceptions which establish the ancient rule. That, while ear adornment was acceptable in representations of a prepubescent king, the wearing of earrings was not considered appropriate for a king who had advanced beyond puberty into manhood. Interestingly, a modern echo of ancient custom is recorded by Winifred Blackman in her 1927 anthropological study, The Fellahin of Upper Egypt. Among the Fellahin, she writes, it is usually the custom to pierce one ear of a young boy if he is an only son, and in this ear he wears a decorative ring. When he gets older, he discards the ring, but the perforation is always visible. What then in the case of Tutankhamun's piercings? One interpretation, obviously, is that the gold mask and associated gold coffin had been prepared before Tutankhamun reached adolescence and had therefore been equipped with a child's earrings and that these earrings had subsequently been removed and the piercings plugged for the simple reason that Tutankhamun lived beyond adolescence and was buried as a full adult. Theoretically, this is possible, but the mask and inner coffin are full-sized, not those of a child, and we have in any case already established that preparations for Tutankhamun's burial had scarcely begun at the time of his death. Almost certainly then, this is not the right answer. My suggestion is that we consider a different possibility, that the anomalies of the replaced face are indeed significant, and that in company with other items closely associated with Tutankhamun's mummy, the mask and inner coffin had originally been prepared for a woman. The photograph taken by Burton at the time of the discovery and shown here on the left offers a timely reminder that Tutankhamun's gold mask was but a single element in the outer adornment of the king's mummified body. The mask's companion pieces in this external decoration were several and comprised the following. A gold-mounted resin scarab suspended on ornamental straps made up from odd sections of reused gold trappings. A pair of separately modeled cheap gold hands sewn onto the mummy wrappings and clasping the crook and flail. A winged barbird pectoral. Inlaid inscriptional bands positioned over and along the lines of the shroud's linen retaining strips. And the ornamental side straps previously discussed, made up from the same series of components employed as suspension for the scarab number two. Where they are visible, the names on these mummy trappings and the names on the base, the base of the scarab number two are consistently those of Tutankhamun. Intact cartouches on the unseen undersurfaces, however, of both the scarab suspension bands number two and the ornamental side straps number six show these particular elements to have originally been prepared for a quite different pharaoh, and Capure Nefenefru Artem, and to have only subsequently been adapted for use by Tutankhamun. 
who had been the original owner of these trappings? Who, who was Ankeprare Nefenefraten? For years, Egyptologists have assumed this pharaoh to have been a young man and co-regent of Akhenaten. An important recent discovery, however, by the French Egyptologist Marc Gabold, reveals that this co-regent bore a significant and re revealing epithet, Akhet Enhies. This translates as one who is beneficial for her husband. Clearly, Nefenefroatum was not a young man at all, but a woman, who, by her epithet, was Akhenaten's wife. Akhenaten's co-regent, in other words, the woman who ruled Egypt by his side, was none other than Nefertiti herself. The Nefenefroatum pieces decorating the king's mummy are not the only objects made for a woman which may be recognized in Tutankhamun's tomb. In fact, there are several. Some of these can be identified because they still carry traces of the name of their original owner, like the pectoral at the top left. Others may be recognized because their physique is obviously female, as we see here in the famous statuette of a woman pharaoh carried on the back of a lioness. In fact, the more we look within the tomb, the more reused pieces we are able to discern, male and female. The list of objects in Tutankhamun's tomb, which can now be identified as recycled pieces, is astonishing and includes major elements within the king's burial, uh, core burial equipment, shrines, sarcophagus, coffins, mummy ornaments. Similarly with Tutankhamun's canopic equipment, most of it seems originally to have been made for someone else, including the outer gilded shrine and certainly the elaborate alabaster box and four small gold coffinets within which the king's embalmed viscera were stored. Of this reused canopic material, again, a significant proportion may be recognized as female in design. And where inscriptions survive, it's apparent that the bulk of these pieces had been prepared originally for Ankh Kepurure Nefenefru Aten, Akhenaten's ruling queen, Nefertiti. Let's examine a little more closely, four items from Tutankhamun's treasure which tell the full story of this reuse, the canopic coffinets. These containers, each measuring 39 centimeters high, are made of gold, delicately worked and exquisite, exquisitely inlaid. Ostensibly, they represent a king. They wear the nemes headdress, they grasp the insignia of royalty, the crook and the flail, and in each, the upper torso is shown enveloped in the protective wings of a goddess. But there is something odd about the representations, something not obvious until it's pointed out. The peculiarity is this. The simple feathered decoration of these coffinets lower halves is not pharaonic at all. The decoration at this point is that of a queen, as confirmed, I think, by the identical lower body scheme of the coffin prepared for Akhenaten's secondary wife, Kia, shown here in the center, number two. How does this lower body scheme differ from that of a king? In mortuary representations of a full pharaoh, both the upper torso and lower limbs are enclosed in enfolding wings, two sets, as seen in number one. When these coffinets had been taken over for Tutankhamun's use, the names on the outside had been carefully changed by inlaying new hieroglyphs within the existing cartouches. But no attempt had been made to update what we now recognize as the half-king, half-queen's style of these coffinets. The technical difficulties involved in reworking their heavily inlaid lower halves was obviously too great for Tutankhamun's undertakers to contemplate. Tutankhamun's second coffin, another reused piece, is modeled en suite with the canopic coffinets. It shares precisely the same design and for the same reasons. Um, it displays the same limited range of external alterations. If we turn to the inside of the coffinets, we find confirmation that these had indeed been taken over from a woman. Close inspection of the inscriptions on the interior gold linings reveal obvious changes. The names of Tutankhamun are demonstrably later additions inscribed over incompletely erased but still legible cartouches, which can once again be seen to have carried the original name Ankh Kepru Re Nefenefru Aten. On both representational and inscriptional grounds, therefore, 
Tutankhamun's canopic coffinets, like the scarab suspension, the decorative side straps of the mummy, and a veritable host of other mortuary items, had demonstrably been intended for use by a woman and as part of the burial of Akhenaten's female co-regent, that is, by Nefertiti herself. These female coffinets display one further and highly significant distinguishing feature, and one which serves to associate them directly with and clarify the original ownership of the gold mask. Look carefully at the detail on the right. The earlobes of all four display not ordinarily dimpled indentations, but fully achieved piercings. In other words, as we concluded earlier for the gold mask, the coffinets too, in their original manifestation, will have carried ear ornaments. And since we were able to demonstrate that their original owner had been Akhenaten's co-regent, Ankepre Nefenefroaten, also known as Nefertiti, then these ornaments will almost certainly have been a variation on the large domed studs seen worn by Nefertiti in her later representations. As with Tutankhamun's uh, appropriated coffinets, so then with the gold mask and, of course, the innermost gold coffin. The shared, essentially feminine feature of drilled earlobes serves to identify the original owner of this core group of Tutankhamun's mortuary objects, not as a man, but as a woman and co-regent queen, Ankepru Re Nefnefraten, that is, the later manifestation of Akhenaten's former great royal wife, Nefertiti. The history of the gold mask may be summarized then as follows. First, its original manufacture for Nefertiti as co-regent or ruling queen of the pharaoh Akhenaten. Second, the face of Nefertiti cut out. And third, a new portrait of Tutankhamun inserted, made in a slightly different alloy. And, and the original Nefertiti ears, now minus their ear ornamentation, reattached. Finally, the piercing in these female ears piercings in these fem female ears were deliberately covered over with slips of dish gold foil to effect a masculine dimpled indentation and avoid any possible misperceptions regarding the sex and identi identity of the mask's final owner. What broader conclusions may be drawn? Well, that an, an already extensive list of this ruling queen's funerary equipment within KV62 may now be supplemented by the gold mask and the innermost gold coffin, transforms, I would suggest, our understanding of Tutankhamun's burial. For not merely a proportion of Tutankhamun's core funerary items, shrines, sarcophagus, coffins, masks, mummy trappings, had originally been prepared for Nefenefraten, it, it now seems very probable that most of it had. This comes as a, as a distinct surprise, and it carries much in its wake. One example, how, how was Tutankhamun able to draw upon so much, perhaps all, of Nefertiti's co-regent equipment? Did his people simply reopen her burial and take what they needed? Surely that's unlikely. Or were these items simply lying unused in temple or palace storage and so readily available for Tutankhamun to take over? Which, if the case, raises even more questions. For if the equipment was taken out of store unused, then how had Nefertiti actually been buried? Had she in the end lost her pharaonic status in consequence of her failed and treasonable attempt to marry a Hittite prince? Was she demoted and buried as an ordinary queen? Was she not buried properly at all? Or are we to discern quite the opposite? A conclusion her parley with the Hittites would now actually argue that since in the immediate aftermath of Akhenaten's death, uh, Akhenaten, uh, Nefertiti was in a position to conduct such negotiations, she was now established as full pharaoh, and as such merited, and in the end received, a superior burial of full pharaonic status. Here, linking with this question, is the much-discussed tomb KV-55. What if, for all its ramshackle nature, this represents Akhenaten's first and only burial rather than a reburial transferred from El Amarna? What if Akhenaten had never been buried at Amarna with the rich funerary equipment he'd prepared and of which a few pieces would later turn up in Tutankhamun's own tomb? 
Is it possible that Nefertiti's co-regent mortuary equipment had been abandoned for the simple reason that she was entitled to something very much better? Had Akhenaten been relieved of his intended coffins and equipment in order that an appropriate, fully pharaonic burial could be provided for his short-lived female successor? Many questions clearly still remain, but recognizing Nefertiti's original ownership of the KV-62 gold mask moves forward significantly, I'd suggest, our understanding not only of Tutankhamun's burial, but of several related complexities of the, of the immediate post-Amana era. Indeed, it does more. It raises afresh the suspicion that there is still much to play for in the Valley of the Kings. For it was here, I think, within the Theban cliffs, that Nefertiti is likely to have been buried and to slumber still. And my guess is, as full pharaoh, in a tomb which may, not only, still be intact, but with a funerary equipment to put Tutankhamun's essentially queenly burial to shame. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>